Good morning, everyone. A warm welcome to Sunday worship and a particular welcome too to those who are joining us on Zoom. Uh, whether you're physically present or whether you're um, behind a screen, it's nice to have you with us. We hope that you'll all enjoy the blessing of our service, including those visitors who are present with us here today. For those in church, just a reminder that teas and coffees are served in the church cafe downstairs fellowship. I also want to say a word of thanks to those who have been painting downstairs. Um, uh, you'll, as you head down, if you're going to coffee, you'll see that it's all brightly painted and uh, the plates on the doors are back up and everything is looking very, very um, beautiful. So um, thank you to those who have been doing that on our behalf. This evening, our Bible study resumes and we are working our way through the Gospel of Luke. Um, these meetings are on Zoom, so if anyone would like to join us, please contact Neil Mitchell or myself. Concerning the joint board and session meeting and also the stated annual meeting, elders and members of the congregational board, please note a correction to last week's intimations. The joint Kirk session and board meeting will take place on Tuesday the 22nd of March at 7.30pm in the large hall. And the stated annual meeting will take place the following week on Tuesday, the 29th of March at 7.30 p.m., as was previously circulated by email. So that's the joint board and session, first of all. That's Tuesday, the 22nd at 7.30, and the stated annual meeting the following week on Tuesday, the 29th. As part of the new presbytery plan, talks with the Kirk session of Dysart St. Clair and our own Kirk session have been taking place. These talks are about the two congregations coming together in a more formal way. The latest meeting was one with both Kirk sessions, which took place on Monday evening. Feedback from this discussion has been passed to the presbytery mission planning team and they will make recommendations which will be brought to the presbytery. The intention of Fife Presbytery is that it will know all the details of the proposals for all congregations across the presbytery by its June meeting. It's not just ourselves that are being assessed, it's a presbytery-wide assessment. And this follows a ruling by the General Assembly of last year to make a national review and to assist all vacancies until new plans were in place. So there will be more details to come from that, but that's as far as we are at this stage. It is with sadness that we note the death of Mrs. Anne Brown, formerly of 15 Tweed Avenue, who passed away at Abbeyfield House on Friday the 4th of March. The funeral service for Mrs. Brown is to take place on Tuesday the 22nd of March at Kirkcaldy Crematorium. Our thoughts and prayers are with her family during their time of bereavement. We also note with sadness the death of Mr. Jim Kane of 57 Dysart Road, Kirkcaldy, who passed away on the 11th of March. Funeral arrangements for Mr. Kane have yet to be completed. We extend our prayers and our sympathy to his family during their time of bereavement. May they know God's comfort and God's peace. These are all the church notices. Now let us worship God as we sing to his praise and glory. Mission Praise 201. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah.
In Acts chapter 7, verse 10, we read, When Joseph appeared before the king of Egypt, God gave him a pleasing manner and wisdom, and the king made Joseph governor over all the country and the royal household. Let us pray. God ever creating, ever loving, ever leading. When things around us feel chaotic, you are peace. When so much we hear is not reliable, your word is truth. When we are paralyzed by fear and anxiety, your presence is freedom. When we feel bereft and helpless, your love gives us hope. Living God, you are the source of all that matters. We bring you our prayers and our praise today. For you reveal yourself to us in the goodness of creation, in the love and mercy of Christ, your only beloved Son. And through the energy and wisdom of the Holy Spirit. God of compassion, we are creatures who seek our own comfort. We confess that we prefer our own plans to your purposes. We shrink from costly discipleship and put our own interests first. Forgive our fleeting commitment and the times we have indulged our own complaints. Have mercy on us, create in us a new spirit, Inspire us with the energy to do your will and to serve our neighbours in the example of Christ, who taught his disciples to pray using these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our next item of praise is Mission Praise 590. Seek ye first the kingdom of God.
Our Old Testament reading this morning is from, Act, uh, from Genesis chapter 41. We read the whole of the chapter. Joseph interprets the king's dreams. After two years had passed, the king of Egypt dreamt that he was standing by the river Nile, and seven cows, fat and sleek, came up out of the river and began to feed on the grass. Then seven other cows came up. They were thin and bony. They came and stood by the other cows on the river bank, and the thin cows ate up the fat cows. Then the king woke up. He fell asleep again and had another dream. Seven ears of corn, full and ripe, were growing on the stalk. Then seven other ears of corn sprouted, thin and scorched by the desert wind, and the thin ears of corn swallowed up the full ones. The king woke up and realized that he had been dreaming. In the morning he was worried, so he sent for all the magicians and wise men of Egypt. He told them his dreams but no one could explain them to him. Then the wine steward said to the king, I must confess today that I have done wrong. You were angry with the chief baker and me, and you put us in prison in the house of the captain of the guard. One night, each of us had a dream, and the dreams had different meanings. A young Hebrew was there with us, a slave of the captain of the guard. We told him our dreams, and he interpreted them for us. Things turned out just as he said. You restored me to my position, but you executed the baker. The king sent for Joseph, and he was immediately brought from the prison. After he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came into the king's presence. The king said to him, I have had a dream, and no one can explain it. I have been told that you can interpret dreams. Joseph answered, I cannot, your majesty, but God will give you a favorable interpretation. The king said, I dreamt that I was standing on the bank of the Nile when seven cows fat feeding on the grass. Then seven other cows came up, which were thin and bony. They were the poorest cows I have ever seen anywhere in Egypt. The thin cows ate up the fat ones, but no one would have known it, because they looked just as bad as before. Then I woke up. I also dreamt that I saw seven ears of corn, which were full and ripe, growing on one stalk. Then seven ears of corn sprouted, thin and scorched by the desert wind and thin ears of corn swallowed the full ones. I told the dream to the magicians, but none of them could explain them to me. Joseph said to the king, the two dreams mean the same thing. God has told you what he is going to do. The seven fat cows are seven years, and the seven full ears of corn are also seven years. They have the same meaning. The seven thin cows which came up later, and the seven thin ears of corn scorched by the desert wind, are seven years of famine. It is just as I told you. God has shown you what he is going to do. 
There will be seven years of great plenty in all the land of Egypt. After that, there will be seven years of famine, and all the good years will be forgotten, because the famine will ruin the country. The time of plenty will be entirely forgotten, because the famine which follows will be so terrible. The repetition of your dream means that the matter is fixed by God and that he will make it happen in the near future. Now you should choose some man with wisdom and insight and put him in charge of that country. You must also appoint other officials, take a fifth of the crops during the seven years of plenty. Order them to collect all the food during the good years that are coming and give them authority to store up corn in the cities and guard it. The food will be a reserve supply for the country during the seven years of famine which are going to come on Egypt. In this way, the people will not starve. The king and his officials approved this plan, and he said to them, We will never find a better man than Joseph, a man who has God's spirit in him. The king said to Joseph, God has shown you all this. So it is obvious that you have greater wisdom and insight than anyone else. I will put you in charge and obey your orders. Your authority will be second only to mine. I now appoint you governor over all Egypt, engraved with the royal seal, and put it on Joseph's finger. He put a fine linen robe on him and placed a gold chain round his neck. He gave him the second royal chariot to ride in and his guard of honour went ahead of him and cried out, Make way, make way. And so Joseph was appointed governor over all Egypt. No one in all Egypt shall so much as lift a hand or a foot without your permission. He gave Joseph the Egyptian name Zaphinath Panea and Ephera, a priest in the city of Heliopolis. Joseph was 30 years old when he began to serve the king of Egypt. He left the king's court and travelled all over the land. During the seven years of plenty, the land produced abundant crops, all of which Joseph collected and stored in the city. In each city, he stored the food from the fields around it. There was so much corn that Joseph stopped measuring it. It was like the sand of the sea.
May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all arts be able in your sight, O Lord, our strength, and our Redeemer. Amen. Apart from the fact that someone becomes fabulously rich, what happens to those who win the national lottery? And I'm sure that many of you are thinking, well, it all depends. It all depends, Victor, of the ill. The national lottery, happiness for some, misery for others. One newspaper headline featured a woman who claimed she was responsible for the cup of her marriage. True or not, she was sincere in her view that she wished that she had never won all of her millions. Some lottery winner, it won't change me. It's important to them that they don't change as a person, that the winnings won't distort their values. And I applaud those who have managed to keep their feet firmly on the ground, who still realize the value of contributing to society as a whole. A greedy person is a greedy person, whether they live in a cottage or a castle. A good person is a person, whether they are a prince or a pauper. And being poor in itself doesn't make a beggar a saint in any way more makes a rich man a sinner. An honourable person can be trusted whether they are in charge of ten pounds or ten million pounds. It's what's in that person which counts. When Joseph's fortunes finally begin to change, the question of his inner integrity come to the fore. Would he be like the ungrateful wine steward in the previous chapter, or would he maintain his integrity? The story of Joseph is told every Jewish household and passed down from generation to generation. And the enduring question remains, how will Joseph cope when God blesses him in abundance? Will he forget his God and sell out to the Egyptians or will he remain humble and faithful? Well, the story keeps us guessing right up until the final chapter. Remember, here was a man who had been betrayed by his own kith and kin. In many ways, he had been shown more kindness by the Egyptians than by his own people. So in this situation, would his loyalty to God be also divided? At first, there doesn't seem to be a problem. When Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dreams about the seven fat cows and the seven thin cows, he answers, God will give you a favorable interpretation. God is acknowledged as both the giver and the interpreter of the dreams. Joseph never takes credit for the dreams himself, nor does he attribute anything to the Egyptian gods. And that's reflected in the king's replies, for in verse 38, Pharaoh describes Joseph as a man who has God's spirit in him. In verse 39, he says, God has shown you all this. That's quite remarkable for a Pharaoh who would have believed in many gods. It appears that Joseph's reputation is going to remain completely intact. Joseph is in danger of appearing too good to be true. As one commenter says, he is the conscientious slave, the irresistibly handsome youth, the silent and victim of calumny, the considerate steward, the nonchalant interpreter of dreams, the easy superior of all Pharaoh's wise men, the instantly efficient prime minister. But a greater test for Joseph is still to come. In parallel to his life, Joseph is treated like the king's favoured son. He's presented with a fine linen robe. He is given the place of honour and adulation. He receives a gold chain round his neck and the royal ring as seal of approval. Placed 
second in command to Pharaoh himself. He has given the royal chariot and guard of honor to shout, Make way, lords, it for all the people. As in the days of his youth, Joseph assumes the center of attention. Once more will this favored position be the source of his downforgotten place in his success story. Is this reflected in his new Egyptian name? A name which literally means the God speaks and he lives. More alarm bells ring when we learn that Joseph is given in marriage to an Egyptian. Not just any Egyptian, for Asenath, daughter of an Egyptian priest. Asenath lived in the city Heliopolis, the city of the sun god. Had Joseph married an Egyptian religion, well, a Egyptian wife. To this day, intermarriage is to, to marry a Jewish faith is to now own Jewish identity. When I was in the divinity faculty at Aberdeen University, there was a fellow student who happened to be Jewish. During her studies, she fell in love with a Christian, and in due course, they were not long after their family had refused to speak to her. Such was the strength of their feelings. She became totally cut off. In the story of Joseph, and from a Jewish perspective, Material success was not the most important concern. Joseph would have ruled the world, but if he abandoned his faith, he would be regarded as a complete failure. So suspense is piled on suspense when we learn that Joseph had not one, but two sons by Asana, his Egyptian wife. But you see, Joseph had not forgotten his God. He named his son Asenath and explained God him had made forget his suffering. He named his second child Ephraim, explained that God had given him children even in the land of his trouble. For Joseph, God would always be like an oasis in the desert, essential for life itself. Joseph was on a journey of discovery, and through this journey, he would discover God's greater plan. God would reconcile his family, and he would also give the nation in the process. Bring the family came from all over the world to born from Joseph. And of course, in those days, the world simply meant the countries all around Egypt in those days, the centre of the world, you might say. Joseph didn't just rescue his family, he rescued the whole world. And ultimately, he's a figure who points towards Jesus, the one who is used by God to save and reconcile all humankind, like every towards Jesus and good. Jesus is. Of course, Joseph was not the Son of God, and in this story we see his strengths and his weaknesses in equal measure. At best, Joseph is the eternal optimist, always true to his God. If his life had gone on, he would have remained his father's favourite son. He would have said and married Israelite woman. He
Let's pray. God in whom we move and our being, come to you in prayer, trusting that you are with us, the ups and downs, the joys and sorrows of these challenging days. We give you thanks for every sign of your presence with us, for every unexpected kindness, every word of comfort or encouragement. Every sign of courage in the face of injustice. Every hopeful step towards reconciliation amid conflict. And healing in the face of disease or danger. Thank you for your presence with us in all things. Dear Lord, Jesus show us that he planned of man and the pressure of many critics. For all those who are ready these days, bring more demands resources in the work at home in church. We pray for those who cannot seem to get it, whatever they do. Those facing unfair criticism the expectations in the responsibility there on behalf of others. Be strengthened by your spirit of justice. In this unpredictable world, lives are caught in terror. And for those living in this, we are to walk freely. We remember people of Ukraine and all who find the uncertainty over living in in your company. We can War around the world, he prepared all the fight. Flat despots crumble to dust, and tears cry out for us, heard heavenly voices. Help those. We cause war to work all people live with the peace of Christ in their hearts. As our thoughts and turn towards the cross, we pray for us who walk the road of suffering. As well as Jesus miles to safety, we also those who have been to sorrow or despair through death, critical illness, or chronic pain, of COVID, or physical hardship. Remember those in hospital who have complex problems that seem to have no end. So today, all those and prayers, both near and far, and around this world, comfort and compassion. Lord, we need the eyes of you, just our own. So anoint us with your little of hope. And rest in a world of real peace to our lives and to this world which you love with us love. The same love shown on the cross of the rain. All these prayers in the name and for the of Christ. Crucified and risen. 
Amen. We conclude our worship today as we sing to him. I will sing the wondrous glory of the Christ. share God's love with all whom you meet. Go now and share the joy of Jesus. Go in peace assured of God's love. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Please be seated.